So, sorry for that. We're going to actually kick off here for Sarah. Uh, so a little bit of Sarah's background. Sarah is a uh, current employee of Carbon Black, another fine Boston company. Uh, so she's a threat analyst, or threat intel analyst, excuse me. Previously, she worked as a security operations team manager or? Just an analyst. Just an analyst. I uh, hold an MSIA from Northeastern University. With that, sorry for the delay on my part, Sarah Miller. <laughs> Okay, so last talk of the day. Thank you for coming. Um, I know we're all excited to get on to the closing ceremonies and the uh, networking event, but this talk is called uh, Haystacks in Your Needles, Threat Hunting in Real World Data. Um, you probably want to know who's giving the talk, so that's my Twitter picture. It's a disgruntled hedgehog. Um, and I am a threat intel analyst for Carbon Black. I started, uh, I was an ESL teacher originally, and then I thought computer security sounded really interesting. So I went to Northeastern, I got a master's program, uh, and then I uh, started in the Carbon Black SOC uh, three years ago, was on the blue team for two years, and then got moved over to the product side. So my current job is uh, analyzing malware, looking at attack campaigns, and trying to find behavioral signatures that our customers can use to detect attacks malware in their environments. So this is a talk about false positives. I just said my job is to look for um, sort of behaviors that you can use to identify attackers and malware. And it turns out that this is a really hard problem. It's a really hard problem for two reasons. The first reason, which I have this picture, there's actually an octopus in that picture pretending to be a piece of coral. Um, the first reason that this is difficult is because malware is trying really, really hard to look legitimate and actors are trying really, really hard to look legitimate. So the closer that they can get to looking legitimate, the harder it is for us to detect. And that's why they're trying really, really hard to do that. The second problem is that you have a bunch of really smart threat researchers who are all looking at malware and looking at attack data in very isolated, clean environments. Um, and they're actually not going out and they're not sitting in a sim all day dealing with all of the weird false positives that come out when you take these beautiful signatures that detect malware in a lab and put them in a real environment. It turns out that real environments have all kinds of weird things that your users are doing, your IT admins are doing, um, the people who wrote your software is doing, your security software is doing, and you have no idea um, kind of what, what noise you're gonna get until you actually start testing stuff out in the real world. Um, so that's what this talk is about. This talk is about why it's so difficult to come up with signatures that actually work. Um, so, because this talk is basically a bunch of uh, unconnected examples, I needed a little bit of a framework, and everybody loves the kill chain, so I went there. Um, if you don't know what the kill chain is, um, you probably haven't been to a lot of talks today, but um, uh, for my mom, who is here and knows nothing about technology, uh, <laughs> um, the kill chain is basically a, s a series of steps that attackers use to get into a targeted network. Um, I've used the, I've show a screenshot of the MITRE kill chain here because um, I work with endpoint data. Uh, they focus on sort of a lot of the different tactics and techniques that happen once you're on an endpoint trying to achieve your objectives and stay hidden. Um, and originally when I gave this talk, it was 50 minutes long. I've cut it down to 25, which means I didn't get to do an example for every single step in this one. But I do have a few examples, and they are organized in the, uh, in, in the order of the kill chain. So we're going to be going through those. OK, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is a reconnaissance false positive. Uh, reconnaissance, you're outside the network. You want to learn about the target. You want to figure out how you can get in. Um, a really common uh, technique in reconnaissance is scanning. Um, two types of scans that you're kind of looking for. One is uh, sort of scanning every port on, an I on a particular server or particular IP. So, you know, they want to profile it, they want to see what services are open, they want to see if any of those services are vulnerable, but it's all ports on one IP. The other type of scan that you see a lot, and we generally treat it as a nuisance scan, is when you have an IP that's going, or you have an IP that's going across all of your servers and it's checking port 22 on everything, or it's checking uh, port 3389. So it's looking for just an open service that it thinks uh, is easy prey, it's gonna look for a nice, easy target um, 
but it's sort of one port across all servers. So this is a really distinctive behavior. Um, our sims know about it, our firewalls know about it, your tier one analysts know about it, um, and they have sort of an expectation of, of what this is. So we were in the SOC in our sim, um, and we had this alert pop up, and this was kind of alarming. Um, it was an internal IP, so someone's workstation or someone's server, and it was reaching out to the internet to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of IPs out on the public internet and trying to hit port 137. For those of you who don't know, port 137 is something that you're only supposed to see in your local internal network. It's a protocol called NetBIOS, which is used for other computers to discover the host names locally. But it should never be going out to the internet. And the fact that it's going out to so many hosts looks exactly like one of those nuisance scans we were talking about where you're looking for one service across a wide range of hosts. So if you're working in a SOC and you see this, your first thought is someone got into my network and they compromised this one computer inside my network and now they're using that computer to go bother other people on the internet. Um, so that was kind of our first thought and we were like, what is this? We did a bunch of investigation and we actually figured out that what happened was that a developer was running process monitor and web browsing at the same time. Um, and this actually causes this behavior. So what's happening is Process Monitor is looking at everything that's running on your computer, um, and it has a setting that allows you to resolve any network addresses that it makes connections to. Um, it does this by using DNS, but it turns out that if the DNS lookup fails, it then tries to NetBIOS the host. So if you're web browsing, you're connecting to hundreds of IPs out on the internet, it tries to do DNS lookups for all of them. It fails, and then it tries to NetBIOS them. Um, so kind of our, our, after the first one, we spent the first time we saw this, we spent a, a good bit of time trying to figure out exactly what the hell was going on. And then after that, we'd see it, and we'd message the developer and say, are you running Procmon in web browsing? He'd say yes, and we'd say, stop it. Um, so it turned out to be you know, not a big deal, but also it looked exactly like a scan to the sim. Um, and they had no way of knowing that this was a behavior of Procmon's. And how would they even know that Procmon was on that endpoint? Um, so kind of an interesting, no one could have predicted that this was gonna go wrong. Okay, so reconnaissance, you've learned about your network. Next thing, you wanna get inside your network, you need to deliver an exploit in some way, get a foothold. A uh, really common way of doing this is phishing emails. And so we spend a lot of time doing user education about phishing emails telling them, you know, if it's from someone you don't know, be a little cautious. If it's from, uh, if it's got an attachment, be a little cautious. If it's asking for your password, you know, throw up the big red flags, contact someone. It's, they should never be asking for your password in email. Be careful of links. Um, we have all these different examples of phishing emails where they're trying to get passwords out of people. So we had a user, uh, submit this to us and say, hey, I think this is a phishing email. Um, what should I do? And it's a secure message from this company. Um, the user had never heard of this company before, had never interacted with them. Um, and it says, you've received a secure message. There's an attachment, an HTML attachment called secure doc. Um, to open the attachment and read your secure message, uh, type in your password. Um, and if you look at the attachment and sort of just look at what it presents to you, the HTML in a browser, you see this very nice little uh, uh, envelope sort of looking thing. And it has, you know, from and to. And again, you've got a secure message from this company and then a little box for your password. Um, if you go a step further and you look at what is actually making up the HTML, you see a bunch of this JavaScript. And this is really obfuscated JavaScript. It's really hard to figure out what it's doing. Um, if you've ever looked at JavaScript malware, it's all super obfuscated all the time. Um, even sort of normal JavaScript can be kind of tough to read, but generally when you see stuff like this, you start thinking, oh, it doesn't want me to know what it's doing. So it has all of this gibberish in there and all of these weird variable names. But it turns out this is not a phishing email. This is a real product that Cisco puts out um, called the Registered Envelope Service. If you don't have uh, SMIME or PGP configured, you, can't, you don't have email security working, this was sort of an older solution for that. Um, now we have all these sort of secure 
file transfer things that we might use instead, but at the time, this was a good way to send secure messages. Um, so uh, for us, our, our user wasn't used to this. Uh, she reported it to us, we investigated, we figured out that it wasn't a fish because we saw um, where the HTML was connecting out to and it was all legitimate Cisco domains. Um, but it was really interesting because you could imagine as a red teamer, if you found out that an organization was using this service and then you sent them something that looked exactly like this and just changed the IPs that it was beaconing out to, you could probably get their passwords. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and if anyone here is a red teamer who ends up using that on a client, I'd be interested to know how successful it is. Okay, so uh, we've done our recon. We've done our delivery. Let's talk about exploits. Um, it was really interesting being in the keynote this morning because he has a couple of examples that I talk about also. Um, and the first one of those is encoded command PowerShell. Uh, so uh, Palo Alto did a really great article at the beginning of March where they took about 4,000 samples of um, PowerShell malware and they look at the different arguments that it uses to run. Um, so since they were specifically looking at encoded command, 100% of their samples had that command line argument. Um, they had different variations of it because you don't always have to write out encoded command, but all of them use that command in one form or the other. Um, they also had some other commands that you might see showing up in these uh, different PowerShell malware samples. So, uh, and most of these are either trying to hide themselves from the user or trying to get around some type of security policy or profile that you might have configured. So, uh, window style hidden, non-interactive, um, no exit and no logo are all trying to hide themselves, make themselves less obvious. Um, and no exit is, ac actually, I just said that, no exit is PowerShell continues running after um, you execute the commands. So a little bit of um, persistence there. Um, and then execution policy bypass or unrestricted and no profile are both used to sort of get around if you had security um, settings configured for PowerShell, this will get rid of them. Um, so they looked at malicious PowerShell and they said, these are the frequency that these uh, particular arguments show up in our malicious PowerShell. And I looked at that and I thought, that's really interesting. Um, I'm very cynical and I'm very dubious about these things because I spend a lot of time um, QA testing signatures. So I said, uh, I wonder how many legitimate environments see this and what kind of legitimate encoded PowerShell is running out in the wild. Um, so I took a small sample of our customers, between 50 and 100, and I looked uh, in their environments for these different things. Um, and I found that I found 4% uh, of them had legitimate encoded command PowerShell. Um, and these max numbers are sort of in one customer environment, uh, what was the highest number of results I got when I looked for this particular command. So there was one customer environment I looked at that had uh, 1,700 uh, different encoded command PowerShell processes running. Um, and this is, uh, you can imagine if you're working in a SOC, you put in an alert for encoded command PowerShell and then you get 1,800 uh, hits back, you get 1,800 alerts in your SIM, you're gonna go a little bit nuts. Um, so clearly, in a lot of environments this works really well and in some environments it's gonna drive you nuts with false positives. Same with some of these other commands. Um, so hidden and execution policy bypass were kind of the, most, the two most common in the sample set I was looking at. Um, a few others were much less common. And again, this was a pretty small sample, so um, it may not be representative of sort of organizations as a whole. And I've also been discovering that there's a lot of variation in organizations. So what's very normal in one organization is not normal at all in a different one. Um, which is why it's really kind of, it's all about kind of what's going on in your environment, your baseline, your sense of normal. So you say, okay, well, what, what is running legitimately and wants to encode things? Um, and we found a lot of VDI tools that were doing it. Um, so here's a couple of examples. Newtnix does it, um, and then I forget, and Vagrant does it, and we have their encoded command examples, and then we have what they decode as. Um, so, Nothing super, super uh, malicious going on here, but for whatever reason, they're using the encoded command argument. Um, the Palo Alto blog post does go on to say there are certain combinations 
of commands that are, or certain combinations of arguments that are more uh, frequent in malware or less frequent in malware. Um, but as Dave was saying this morning, it's really easy for an attacker to change those once they know you're looking for a particular pattern. So it can, it can help you detect things, but it can also give you a sense of false confidence. Okay, so we're on the host, we've exploited it. Um, we don't wanna get kicked off too quickly, so one of the things that we're gonna do while we're on a host is probably some type of evasion. So there's a whole bunch of different things that malware might do for evasion, um, but one of the really interesting ones that I like is uh, checking for AV products. This can be both checking on the host to see if there's AV running, and also a lot of times it shows up, uh, they're checking to see if they're in a sandbox or if they're in a researcher's VM, and if they are, they're gonna shut down and not do anything interesting so you can't analyze them. Um, so a few different examples here. Uh, Furtim was a piece of malware that uh, Sentinel-1 wrote about last summer. It's really cool, it's really complicated. So they looked at uh, the DLLs that were getting hooked in and they had a list of which AVs use which hooking DLLs. They also looked for kernel drivers and they knew which AVs used which kernel drivers. And I think Furtim is actually the one that would see what AV you had running and then would change its behavior based on which AV you had running. So it wasn't even as simple as uh, I'm gonna shut down now. It was I have specific things that I'm gonna do or not do based on the presence of AV in your environment. Um, second one, Drydex macros. A little bit more trying to detect sandboxes and uh, researchers. So it would beacon out and then it would check uh, the IP or the domain that the traffic was coming from. It had a list of um, different IPs or domains that belong to different vendors and so it would shut down if it was beaconing out from a vendor. Um, and the final one was actually just a sample that a colleague of mine was looking at when I was putting together this talk. Uh, so a sample called iPyramid, which uh, checks your program files directory to see what you have installed, checks your run key, and checks your firewall entries. And here's a screenshot um, of the different uh, various antivirus programs that it was actually looking for. So. You look at this and you say, okay, I understand why malware would do this, or I understand why a malicious actor would do this, but I can't really think of any reason that someone would legitimately check for 20 different AV companies. That seems weird. So I think to myself, okay, I'm pretty confident that if I see this, this is malware, this is a bad actor, you know, th this should be high confidence in theory. So we got this submitted from a customer in December, um, December 8th, which I'm mentioning that specifically because if you look at the compilation timestamp down here, it's uh, November 30th. So this was pretty new. Um, it doesn't have a lot of metadata describing what it is. It has kind of an innocuous name. It doesn't have a description. It is not signed by the publisher. Um, and it gets a 17 out of 61 on virus total. When you look at it, it's a very small, it's a DLL, so it's meant to be loaded by some and run by some other process. And all it does is it has a list of AVs and it checks the AVs uh, to see if they're there and it checks what version they are and then it writes them out to an XML file. That's all it does. So we look at this and we go, okay, we know that uh, evasion is something that malware does. Maybe this is a piece of malware because it's a DLL, we know we don't have the whole story. So we uh, sort of go back and forth with the customer, we get more data about where it is, I think it was in a temp directory, which made it even worse. Um, and we finally uh, are able to confirm that this is actually part of their VPN software. Um, so a lot of companies on your VPN, they won't let you connect until they've checked that your software is fully patched and you have the AV that your IT department put on and it's completely updated and your GPO is updated. And that looks like this, and it's completely legitimate. Um, so I don't, uh, so I scanned this again on April 1st, and it still had that pretty high score in virus total. And I'm not saying that to talk about how silly AV vendors are, because I think this is actually a really hard choice to decide if all you have is a static, this is bad or this is not bad, what are you supposed to do with this particular DLL? It's doing something that we know malware does, but it's not malware. So I don't think the 17 AV vendors who mark this as malicious are necessarily wrong, and I don't think the, uh, you know, the other 
40 something who marked it as non malicious are necessarily, they have the right answer, right? Like, um, this could just have easily been malicious. And based on this binary isolated by itself without knowing anything about the process that ran it, there's just no way to know for sure. Okay. So that's one type of evasion. The other type of evasion, which again uh, is kind of overlapping with the keynote this morning, um, is that if you have a legitimate process, you're using PowerShell, you're using command, something like that, uh, people are monitoring for it, and your security software is often monitoring for it, looking for malicious things based on the process name. So if you change the process name, they don't know, uh, they're no longer monitoring, and therefore you can run sort of whatever you want undetected. So the top example here um, is a run DLL process, but it's been renamed to servicehost.exe. Um, so both legitimate Windows binaries, but because run DLL 32 can be abused, and we know it can be abused, they've renamed it. And this was a uh, ransomware sample called CryptXXX that was you know, briefly popular over the summer before something else took advantage, took, uh, took precedence over it. Uh, the bottom example, again, is uh, command, the Windows command processor, and it's just been renamed to johnson.exe. So I'm not sure who Johnson was, um, but he, had, he was used uh, to evade someone's security software at some point. So okay, this is kind of cool, this is kind of interesting. You start thinking, how do I catch this? Um, there's kind of two options that come to mind. One is you get a, a list of all of the hashes for PowerShell and you compare them against the name of the running process, and uh, if it has the PowerShell hash, but it's not named PowerShell, then you, you know, do something about it. Um, this is kind of, it's hard for it to be human readable. There's a lot of opportunities for error. You might miss a version of PowerShell. You have to keep it updated all the time. So maybe not great. Um, the other option, which is kind of interesting, we were kind of playing around with it, is to be able to compare the binary metadata, the internal description or the internal name, against the path or the process name. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different examples of that. It works really well to detect sticky keys. Um, it works really well to detect renamed command, renamed PowerShell. But it does have false positives. The false positives happen when your company goes international. Because at that point, your French computers or your Chinese computers are going to have their binary metadata in the local language. Um, so that can be kind of an interesting problem. And I, I, I like that example because, you know, if you have a threat research team that's all American or American and UK and Canada, um, and they're working uh, and thinking about things from a, an English-speaking perspective, there might be things that are normal in other environments that they don't know about. Um, so it's kind of a good, a good reminder that even if we're based in one place, a lot of times, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to do security all over the world. So, okay. I think I might actually be on time. This is exciting. Okay, so those are a few examples, and that leaves us with the question, there's the problem, what's the solution? Um, if I can't trust what my vendors are telling me is malicious or not malicious, um, and, you know, I, I get stuff from the FireEye blog post, I run it in my environment, and it has hundreds and hundreds of false positives, what do I do about this? Um, and the first step is not to panic. Um, sometimes when you start threat hunting or you start investigating a false positive, you realize there are thousands and thousands of uh, processes that are coming up in your search, coming up in your hunt. Um, you are going to be able to figure out an answer and you are going to be able to figure out what's normal in your environment. You just need to put a little bit of time and a little bit of thought into it. So first thing is really understanding what it's trying to alert on or what the thing that you're looking for, um, what the, you know, the bit of advice that f you took from the FireEye blog post is actually trying to find, right? So why does an attacker want to use the encoded command switch? Um, the more you understand about what the alert is actually based on, the easier it is to tell if it's a false positive or not. The other part is that the more you understand about uh, sort of the intent of it, the easier it is to ask the question, well, okay, if I detect encoded command and I detect PowerShell, is there anything that the attacker can do to change those and still kind of get their, their objective? So it allows you to start thinking really creatively and not get too tied down to a specific set of indicators. Um, the other part is looking for patterns unique to your environment. So I don't know what you've got running in your environment. Um, 
And I don't know if you've got a VDI tool that's running encoded PowerShell, but you do. And it's going to be really obvious as soon as you start looking. So now you know, OK, encoded PowerShell in my environment should look exactly like this. And if it doesn't look exactly like this, then I want to see an alert from it. Um, another really good one that I think more people should be, uh, should be profiling is uh, PowerShell that makes network connections outside your environment. You will, there are some environments where it will. A lot of people, a lot of IT admins use PowerShell to talk back to Microsoft, um, get updates, get patches, stuff like that. But it's not going to be all of the organizations, and you can still profile that. You can whitelist the Microsoft IPs and get IPs for, you know, if it connects out to anything that's not Microsoft, you want to know about that. So you're not going to be able to get rid of everything. Um, you're not going to be able to get rid of all the false positives in your sim. You're not going to be able to make all threat hunts work perfectly. Um, so what do you do? You tune out the stuff that you can. Um, if your tools aren't letting you tune things and they aren't being really granular, um, push back on the vendor and say, I really, really want this. Please let me tune this. Um, and the stuff that you can't tune out, document it. You're going to get new SOC analysts in. You're going to get new blue teamers. You're going to get in IR consultants when you have a breach who don't know your environment. And if they can say, hey, why is this printer making this weird network connection? And you say, oh, yeah, we investigated that two years ago. Here's what it's doing. Here's the steps we used to find it. Um, and having this really, really rich wiki, that's going to make everything a lot faster. So takeaways, and we're just about done. Um, the vendors are, are, there's a lot of really smart people working for the vendors. I work with these brilliant people every day, but that's only half the battle, and their knowledge and their experience only solves half of the problem. The other half of the problem is what's normal in your environment, and honestly, the blue teamers are the experts there. So don't feel bad about working in a SOC, or don't feel like you're less important than a malware researcher because you work in a SOC, because you are actually an expert in your own environment, and your knowledge is just as valuable or more valuable than sort of the knowledge, this abstract knowledge that's out here. Um, your security tools are making assumptions. They have to make assumptions because a lot of times they just don't have enough information to know for sure. So they have to say, this is malware, or they have to say, this is not malware. Um, and you want to understand those assumptions as far as you can, and you want to be willing to question them and challenge them. Um, I'm a Harry Potter person, so I always think of the quote in the second Harry Potter book where they say, don't trust anything if you can't see where it keeps its brain. Um, and I want to understand, if my sim says, hey, this is a C2, I want to understand why it thinks it's a C2. I'm not going to trust it right away. Um, false positives are not always a waste of your time. This is very controversial. Um, but if you're getting thousands and thousands of alerts that are all the same, yes, that is a waste of your time. If you've gotten a false positive, it's the first time you've ever seen it in your environment, that's interesting. That's worth taking some time to try to understand, you know, what is this false positive about? Why did my tool think that this was malicious? What is actually going on here? Is it new, or did the tool get an update? Um, because all of those things are either going to teach you more about security and more about attackers, or they're going to teach you more about your environment. Um, and finally, configure your tools. Don't take the out-of-the-box settings. Make them specific to your environment, make them about the things that you care about, um, automate what you can, this is, can be hard, um, and then document everything that is sort of weird in your environment, that is not intuitive, and that anything that you've spent 15 minutes investigating, trying to figure out what the hell it is, don't just walk away from that, spend another three minutes writing down what you found. So that's the end of my slideshow, um, the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take questions now, or if people are feeling shy, they can come up to me later. But thank you. Fair enough. I think I had a question.